There has long been an assumption that isolation from the central Canadian art scene and the experiments of the Group of Seven created a maritime hinterland steeped in conservatism. Although travel to many North American venues was difficult and left Nova Scotia outside the central Canadian bubble, the sea had always offered a simple and direct transatlantic connection to put them inside the European milieu or deliver them easily to New York and Boston. Before most of the Group of Seven were born, Haligonians were already introduced to Impressionism in the paintings of Francis Jones. Her Jardin d'Hiver would have registered on the Paris audience simply as an homage 1979 painting of the same title, but in fact it represented a scene in the morning room of her home in Halifax. She is now acknowledged as the first Canadian artist to exhibit an Impressionist canvas, and hers likely the first Canadian. painted Canadian subject to be viewed by the Paris Salon's international audience. Her most Impressionistic painting stayed in Nova Scotia. In Harry in the Morning Room, she has captured Baudelaire's Flaneur Veritable, her painting of an urban, sophisticated young man, a symbol of privilege and leisure held by her objectifying female gaze, however, upsets the conventional view of what a woman artist could or would paint in the 19th century. Even in the work of her lesser contemporaries, like Kate Foss Hill, the influence of the new painting is obvious in tonality and subject matter. The Newfoundlander, Margaret Campbell McPherson, brought 50 paintings for exhibition in Halifax in January 1900, some of which remained in the province to become part of the visual culture here. In 1907 and 8, work by all three artists was included in the loan exhibitions organized by the local Council of Women, and Hill sent work to the Dominion exhibition of 1906 that also included two paintings by Helen McNichol. In 1909, the Montreal star bemoaned the swamping of her individuality in the mannerisms of the modern French school, but in time this will doubtless wear off and she will come into her own. That the NSMFA was the first public institution in Canada to purchase a McNichol painting is evidence of support for advanced painting here. Lismer saw this painting every working day at the art school, which may explain the change in his painting style between 1914 and work he sent to the first Group of Seven exhibition in 1920. Lismer's tenure in Halifax included a time when Cubism came sailing into Halifax Harbor in the form of the Dazzle ships. For the indigenous Mi'kmaq, the Dazzle patterns were reminiscent of the chevrons and swirling arcs of a quilled box created around 1780 by an anonymous artist, or the semicircles and rouleau triangles on a box by Madeline Thomas Williams about 1850. If Picasso could claim to Gertrude Stein that dazzle was cubism, then so too were such quill boxes, and the Mi'kmaq artists were the first modernists in the country. In Europe, Impressionism had been succeeded by various post-Impressionist styles, Edith Smith was continuing her studies in London at the time of Roger Fry's second exhibition in October 1912. The broad brushwork and the colours she had chosen to use as highlights in near the Chelsea School of Art strongly recommend that she had been impressed by the Fauvist Maurice de Vlamic's barges on the Seine at that exhibition. The Art Deco motif of the ceramist Alice Egan Hagen's peacock tail plate in 1915 evidences the luster wear techniques and ideas she had absorbed during study in France. The new style, visually pleasing but not intellectually threatening, was common in Paris in 1915, but unknown most of North America. So again, evidence of modernism here. At the MFA school in Boston, Una Gray would have seen young mothers sewing in the 1909 Mary Cassatt exhibition at the St. Baltoff's Club. For this equally quiet domestic scene, she has converted Cassatt's mother and child focus to that of two friends or sisters, but her diagonal composition for learning to braid echoes that of Cassatt's painting. Mabel Killen began studies at the Chase School in New York in 1905 but followed Robert Henry to his own school in 1909, along with future members of the Ashcan School. 
Her mature work represents a marriage of Henry's philosophical commitment to, to documenting industrial neighborhoods and working class subjects, as in her 66th and Broadway, and the bravura impressionism to which he was emotionally attached. Bleu sur Bleu, Una Gray's first Parisian exhibition in 1922, a largely monochromatic portrayal of the youthful vulnerability of a poilu, reflects the weight of bereavement and trauma in a country that lost almost two million of its citizens to the conflict and influenza. Early in the COVID era, Margaret Macmillan commented that writers and artists barely acknowledged the earlier pandemic, but I've begun to wonder if such depiction of isolation was a result of restrictive quarantines and the isolation imposed for so long. Marjorie Tozer would have experienced both in Halifax. Her postgraduate study in Toronto included exposure to Leon Bast at his exhibition, lecture, and sessions with Lismer's stagecraft class in 1923. The focus of City Market on the isolated figure in the doorway and windswept with its brooding sense of an impending storm recommend the isolation foisted on humankind's perilous existence was her choice of subject matter, influenced by her experience of the influenza epidemic. Elizabeth Kahn would have seen her neighbor, Una Gray's Bleu sur Bleu, at the Salon d'Automne that year, and both sent works there in 1923, when a fellow student, Tamara de Lampica, sent Woman in a Black Dress. Jemmy Kelly already commented here in 2012 on the profound isolation that imbues Kahn's portraits. Her undated portrait of a girl in blue sent to Toronto in 1932, shares the vulnerability of Lempica's figure in the black dress, whom the Figaro reviewer found suffused with anxiety, even if it lacks the latter's suggestion of future assertiveness in the red accessories and reflective surface of the patent leather shoes. Can would have seen Lempica's Duchesse de Valmy in the Chaumière studio, and Cannes' masterpiece, The Artist's Model, shares an antithetical correspondence with it. Cannes' figure vulnerable, Lempica's serenely detached. Both figures hunch one's shoulder and rest one arm on her lap, but Cannes' model has dropped the other lethargically out of sight, while the Duchess uses hers to forestall anyone's advance. By circumstance or choice, each is profoundly alone and isolated from the world. Writing about modern portraiture in 1901, Robert de Montesquieu noted the amalgamation of the personality of the painter with that of the model, so that the portrait reveals the model's innermost character and simultaneously the artist's opinion. Burdened by their generation's inheritance of pandemic-induced isolation, Tozer, Gray, and Kahn may have found in the intellectual construct of Art Deco a means of forcibly representing this angst. Modernism explored industrial age, real life issues and attitudes. Manet, the father of modernism, influenced both Francis Jones and Mary Ross Kelly, who would have seen his provocative Olympia when she was in Paris to study with André Lotte. Seventy years after Manet, Kelly's Betty Murray's Wedding Day provides an updating of his portrayal of law as a contemporary citizen of Paris in Olympia, Kelly has accorded her black subject the simple dignity of any bride of the period, when the usual modernist trope was to limit a black model to her exotic skin tones. Her attitude is more modern than that of her contemporaries. In 1933, Marius Barbo arrived from the National Museum in Ottawa to pronounce to the Canadian club in Halifax that Nova Scotia lags behind the rest of Canada in art. I hope I have offered a challenge to that flawed view from away.